Thank you. So we're going to start fast. I mean, sorry, I'll start my case now. Um, I will have to start by uh, warning you or telling you that my case overlaps significantly, significantly with one of the prior presentations. I mean, P equals less than 0 0.0001 type of significance. <laughs> when, I, when I heard the case, I went, no, she, the case totally <laughs> take away all the excitement of my case. I'm not saying she, who the she is yet. It's still trying to preserve a little bit of uh, mystery, a little bit of <laughs> excitement. But then I think maybe it will be good. Maybe you know all the heavy duty stuff, all the all the science part is covered, and now instead of explaining things, I will just ask you for answers because I think you all will know the answers now. Maybe we'll catch up. Okay, let's get started. Very quick case. So. Um, 65-year-old man presented with all these uh, symptoms and, and you know, bloating, etc. It didn't take much for the doctors to figure out that there's something, uh, there's a big culprit here uh, uh, in the abdomen, big masses, uh, in the retroperitoneum, mesentery, multiple deposits, etc. And there was also mention of lesion contiguous to the bowel. So what came next naturally was the colonoscopy and here, lo and behold, in the right colon here, there is a big thin uh, lesion here. Not a slam dunk, though, because uh, the gastroenterologists say that this could be a colon cancer, but it could also be something coming from outside in. And so this is the biopsy of this big thin, and this is what I gave to you. Uh, only a couple pieces of tumor, and here is a higher power. It does look like something coming from outside in, right? Uh, no precursors and uh, not a typical colorectal morphology. Looked a bit epithelial, epithelial. So if this is keratin positive, then maybe it's just a bad cancer, poorly differentiated, right? Or given all that disease outside and this favorite diagnosis of mine, I always think mesothelioma, maybe it's a mesothelioma because that's the only other thing that may be epithelial and can do this. So yeah, keratins are indeed positive. And, um, and for our mesothelioma uh, consideration, here's calretinin. But, there's a but. Uh, but the other uh, mesothelial markers are all negative, and also some glycoproteins which should be negative in mesothelioma, right? And uh, are positive, as we see here. So putting all of this together, we thought this is most likely just a bad carcinoma. Now, is this colon primary? That's a bit tricky because of the poorly differentiated in nature. And we did all of this site-specific, lineage-specific markers, and they're all negative. But again, that doesn't really mean much because of the poorly differentiated nature. In the end, it really depends on the clinical, right? So if clinically uh, colon was the only primary, is the only primary site, then this could be colon primary. And that's essentially our diagnosis for our clinicians, and they seem to be okay with it. So, but, you know, just among ourselves, pathologists, what about this calretinin positivity, right? Should we be bothered by it? We know calretinin can stain some things other than meso, like adrenal cortical tumors, but colon cancer? So I thought this was one of the small, a small interesting point of this case that may be worth a little discussion. Turns out calretinin positivity in colon cancer is a well-documented uh, phenomenon. You know, calretin has something to do with calcium, typically present in neurons, and apparently in non-neuronal tissues, calretin was first cloned from a colon cancer cell line. So there are some ancestral link between the two. And so these people who um, found this link are really uh, interested in this, and they went even further and tested the protein in colon cancer tissues by immunostaining, and here it is in black and white, some positivity in colon cancer. But interestingly, this is most a phenomenon mostly seen in poorly differentiated tumors, and we are talking 66% in poorly differentiated tumors versus 5% in well diff tumors. And so this was 1999. Let's now fast forward 10 years to now, to, the, to, to a time of color, I guess, and to an 
time when MSI was becoming widely recognized. And so at this uh, time, there was this study that said that yes, calretinin can stain, can stain poorly differentiated colon tumors. And, but here, interestingly, the frequency was only half of what was reported before. And very interestingly, the poorly differentiated tumors that stain for calretinin tended to be MSI high. Okay, let's now fast forward a few more years to now to the current time. This is what we saw uh, in our laboratory. So we had 250 plus cases, uh, colon cancers, and we saw three tumors positive for calretinin. Everybody else was negative. And you'll notice that the three tumors are all poorly differentiated and they're all MSI high. So this, you know, sort of is confirmatory of prior studies, and only the numbers are off. And for overall frequency in poorly differentiated tumors, we've come, come from 66% to 30% to our 9%. So how do you explain that? Maybe antibody specificity, they started, they used uh, polyclonal antibodies initially, and also our tissue array might have missed some cases. One could also question what does this mean clinically or um, you know, biologically? And that's another open question I don't think we really know. And actually one of our fellows, Sandy, is trying to look into this. But from a diagnostic point of view, I thought this was an interesting point for, you know, that this is good for us to keep in mind you know, when it comes to a scenario like our case, uh, this knowledge can come in handy. And so that was, uh, my first little uh, interest, in the first little interesting point of this case. Now back to the case. So as we were pondering about calretinin, our surgeons, radiologists were pondering whether the tumor was resectable because of all that disease. And ultimate, ultimately the decision was made to go in and to, but to start with an exploratory laparoscopy to confirm the disease, right? And also if uh, it was not resectable, then they would get us more tissue because our diagnosis was sort of, you know, conditional, not entirely committal. And so on laparoscopy, tumor not resectable, so, um, so they got us additional pieces of tissues. And as we see here, and this told the diagnosis right away, not even funny, clear cut adenocarcinoma with signaling ring cells and everything, I did not send this out. So, and also at this point, clinically, and they were pretty, uh, they pretty much concluded that colon was the only primary site, and so finally we got a diagnosis. What a diagnosis, a colon cancer. But I thought what I was going to tell you next was really interesting and exciting, but because of this prior to talk, I'm not, you know, there's not that much excitement anymore. So these days we don't just stop at making diagnoses, right? We look for uh, extras, additional traits and features that have specific relevance. And so one of the things we uh, look for is MMR IHC, and we did MMR IHC. And now that we know the tumor is stage four, we also uh, anti EGFR becomes an treatment becomes an option. So we also send tissue for our famous favorite impact assay, so that's cooking. And so the MMR IHC part was the repetitive part, uh, but maybe as I mentioned, now it will be easy. So it turns out this tumor is MMR deficient, right? It's losing uh, MMR proteins. So confirms, you know, like uh, calretinin positive tumors tend to be MMR deficient and certainly held up here. But look what's deficient here, MSH2 and MSH6. So uh, immediate gut reactions, oh, this is a Lynch syndrome. Just like who said? Dr. Dallaire, right? Dr. Dallaire was mentioning that. Um, and so, uh, you know, these uh, few stains do bring up big questions. So we have the question of how to treat the tumor. Now that we know the tumor is MMR, you know, there is types of chemo which was talked about, uh, uh, options of chemotherapy and also uh, extent of surgery when it comes to surgery. And also second big question, how do you treat patient? Because, you know, as we just mentioned, could this be a Lynch syndrome, which is a significant diagnosis as we have already discussed. So. Um, I was going to have a big dis dissertation of, on the question of Lynch, but um, 
but it should go fast. So for the question of Lynch syndrome, workup will have to be done in the context of uh, genetic counseling. That's a very, very important point. So we need to keep that in mind, and that was done. And here we'll just go through some of the findings very quickly. So first uh, finding is about family history. And, uh, and, and you'll notice that this actually is not a typical Lynch pedigree. We're, here's our patient. You go back a few generations, there are a few malignancies, but not the Lynch type. But Deborah told us this doesn't really mean much because uh, family history doesn't exclude Lynch. The diagnosis of Lynch really depends on germline testing. And so here's, here it is, everything negative. Um, all the pertinent genes, including EPCAM, uh, were tested and they were all negative. And so I thought this was a very interesting question that because we now have shown that we don't have evidence of Lynch, then what does the loss of MSH2 and 6 on IHC mean, right? And so, um, so that I thought was a very interesting point of this case. It's still interesting to me, but now it's not a mystery anymore. I think we all know the answer. And so what does it mean? Anybody, fellows, residents? What could it mean? Anyway, so we'll go. Uh, so when you have an MMR deficient tumor, you have different mechanisms, right? So our tumor doesn't have germline mutation, so it doesn't follow this branch, not the Lynch, because Lynch is defined by germline mutation, not a classic sporadic cancer, because there's not MLH1 methylation. So these are the unexplained cases. And we know that the name that's used for these cases is the Lynch-like syndrome. And as has been nicely explained, that the, the, you know, people have started to explain some of this unexplained Lynch-like syndrome. And, um, and not surprisingly, some are true Lynch cases. It's just the underlying mutation is very sneaky and your conventional methods cannot detect. And then there's this very interesting, exciting category uh, that we already discussed, and I will not get into, I was gonna give you more details, which is really interesting to me. But it's, it's, people regard this as a new class of sporadic tumors that are caused not by MLH1 methylation, but by somatic mutation. But I should emphasize here, which I don't think we emphasized before, is that we have to be careful here when we assign these cases with somatic hits. Biolytic mutations in an MMR gene, now we think if you have biolytic mutations in an MMR gene, it's likely a new class of sporadic MMR, MSI uh, cases. But when we uh, assign those cases as sporadic, we have to be aware there, there are some caveats here. And one of them is the difficulty in proving that they are biolytic, and, and Deborah sort of touched on that a little bit. And then another uh, caveat is this somatic mosaicism. This uh, is a complex mechanism. It can cause this kind of somatic hits in, uh, in an MMR gene, and nothing may be detectable in the germline, but there's a defect there, and it can pass on to the next generation. And how do you prove it? And there are ways, I'm sure there are sophisticated molecular ways, but one of the ways is to, act, you have to test your children, your next generation, which is not always easy and not always done in many of these cases that we sign as somatic, uh, um, uh, as sporadic MSI cases. And another caveat is, uh, is this scenario where you actually have a true uh, hereditary, uh, a, a germline defect, a germline culprit, only that a culprit is not in an MMR gene, but in another gene. And MAT1H is a typical um, culprit gene, and the other genes that are reported to be culprits are Paul E, Paul D1. So essentially what happens is you have that germline defect there that will target Usually they have, a tip, they have their typical targets. MOT-YH typically targets the APC, so you get the MOT-YH polyposis, but in some cases they can target the MMR genes as well, so you get this kind of sporadic uh, somatic hits, not sporadic, somatic hits, and having this clinical picture Lynch-like, but fundamentally it's a genetic defect, big difference. 
Okay, so um, how does this relate to our case? Very quickly, just to recap. So we have this tumor that's MMR deficient, but no germline defect, uh, so not Lynch. So we have a legitimate Lynch-like case. And, um, and, and obviously, we explore the etiology, and you know, <laughs> uh, you know, you know where the etiology is going to be. The etiology is that there are multiple, there are three MSH2 mutations here in this case. And in, I'm going to skip a lot of slides. In, um, uh, uh, because of the presence of uh, this is the, these things have all been discussed already. The importance of uh, a next gene sequencing in predicting MSI and, uh, and also help explain the nature of MSI. But in our particular case, this is the three MSH2 mutations that were detected by the, our impact assay. And here are the three uh, mutations again. And as we can see, they affected the important domains, actually. They are deleterious, and they can explain some of, you know, why we also have loss of MSH6 and why we also have uh, um, uh, loss of MMR function. So I think we do have uh, a, a good evidence that we are dealing with an example of this uh, uh, new class of sporadic cases. But again, we have to emphasize all of these caveats when we assign these cases. And so that's essentially the mystery part of our case, why you have loss of MSH2 and MSH6, and yet you don't have a germline mutation. How do you explain it, and how, can, uh, how does the um, uh, next-gen sequencing testing help us explain that? That was the main point of this case presentation, but it, thanks to Deborah, who, uh, she made this uh, interpretation uh, easy. So we essentially have this Lynch-like case, which we think is sporadic in nature. And actually, Deborah's case happened seven years ago. And now, currently, as of uh, August 2016, the current NCCN guidelines is, at, at, at least when it comes to colorectal tumors, when you encounter a Lynch-like case like this, and when you do detect somatic mutations, you can actually treat it like a sporadic tumor. That's the current recommendation, as opposed to a stringent uh, Lynch protocol, which was what happened to Deborah's case seven years ago, or for the past seven years. Okay, just a few words about how, that was about how do you treat the patient, right? The concern of Lynch. And now about the patient's colon cancer. Um, so I, here, the colon cancer was uh, deemed to be stage four, not resectable, and so a non-operative approach was the way to go. And I want you to draw your attention to the time here. Uh, time of diagnosis, this is a very critical time, and this was right after the 2015 ASCO mirror. I'm, I will be done in a minute. <laughs> Uh, 2005, June 2015, but this was right after ASCO meeting where there was this big trial that showed efficacy of uh, immunotherapy, particularly anti-PD-1 treatment in MSI tumors, including colon uh, MSI cancers. So it was at that particular time riding on that wave. So discussions about anti-PD-1 went on and the, person, the patient chose to get on the PD-1 trial. And tumor did respond, but then the effect plateaued after a four-month period, and so at that point, we got a resection. Now here, I'm just showing you a couple of slides to show that how the drug works. It does work. It really gets rid of the tumor, and having this kind of response that we see with the conventional therapy, and of course, there, there are new challenges because the effect stopped in four months, so there are all of these questions for us to figure out why the treatment uh, stopped responding. Um, immune tolerance, et cetera, maybe. So last follow-up, our patient is now 10 months after surgery, and he's doing fine. Um, and that's about our case, and a, a, a big interesting point was, uh, I was going to explain quite a bit, was about how loss of MSH2 and MSH6 doesn't automatically mean Lynch syndrome anymore, and, um, and some other things. Um, but uh, I'm going to cut it short. But I think all these case presentations does reflect, rep show one thing, and that is 
Surgical pathology and, molec and molecular pathology are really intimately integrated these days, and the two together are really the force that's guiding the patient management in a way that's very direct, very individualized. So I think we should be proud. That's all my.